I'm excited to have the pleasure of introducing um, CDL mentor Dr. Pry Baim, uh, a longtime friend of mine. We actually spend our New Year's together as part of a large uh, gathering of uh, uh, sort of friends. Um, and I've been tracking her journey for quite a long time. Um, she's the founder and CEO of Somatics and our next keynote speaker. Um, she founded Somatics in 2009 um, to empower women to be more product proactive um, and informed about fertility through better data, including genomics. Uh, she was on the front lines of the personalized medicine revolution during her doctoral work at, um, at Cornell and was inspired to create the company after completing a postdoctoral embryology research training at University of Cambridge. Realizing how many of the successful and career-minded women in her network were making major life's decisions around fertility based on age alone, she set out to offer to bring personalized medicine to reproductive health. In addition to her scientific credentials, Dr. Byman has also been widely recognized as an emerging business leader. Uh, she is a fellow of the second class, the Aspen Institute Health Innovators Fellowship Program, a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network, and was named a New York City Venture Fellow by the New York City um, EDC to Crane's um, 40 Under 40, top 15 founders disrupting their industries by Fortune, and a top female founder by TechCrunch. She lives in New York City with her husband and three children. Well, one of the things I want to say just before she comes up is that uh, it, we're Pry is addressing a moonshot around transforming women's reproductive health. Half of the planet are women, and the amount of attention that's gone onto in science on women's reproductive health is just, it's, it's vanishingly small. Um, you know, more work has been gone, gone on uh, prostate cancer uh, for men than really the entire rest of the field of women's health. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. Um, and so Pry's taken a stand for this to bring data and technology and bring the, um, you know, medicine and medicine and knowledge and fertility planning really create the entire ecosystem that didn't exist because of just such a colossal gap in funding worldwide. Um, so over 10 years, her company's been devoted to addressing this challenge. They've assembled the most amazing data set, uh, which is really a, a world international asset, um, and um, have begun um, after a pro uh, for going to fertility clinics and developing um, a new kind of test, um, developing decision support systems, bringing evidence-based medicine to fertility treatment and planning, developing similar tests for humans to, uh, for, for um, consumers to use themselves, um, my fertility compass. Um, uh, they've actually then taken all this data they've been assembling and entered into the next phase of their journey, uh, which is actually bringing all this incredible data, um, also curating the entire, uh, making a knowledge graph out of all of the literature uh, concerning women's health, and now bringing that actually towards uh, biosciences and uh, collaborating with pharma companies to enable the next generation of drugs. Um, and uh, these drugs will not just be hormonal and really bad, as been the current uh, state of the uh, state of practice for 50 years for women, but potential actually small molecules and based on amazing insights. Um, one last thing I want to say is that she's actually taken on an even bigger thing We're using all the data, which is to look at, say, how might we actually control menopause? Um, and this is sort of, you know, it's everyone who's a woman understands this as a major issue in the life, and men may not have any idea about, you know, what this means, but there is a fundamental difference here, and you're like, you know, more than half the woman's life is going to be spent in this, and there's a set of changes that happen in the body that have profound implications. Also, life planning choices uh, that happen. Uh, you have to plan your entire life around this kind of thing. Uh, we don't, and also there's health consequences. We don't even know how long women would live if they didn't have this. So Pry has actually been assembling all this data and actually has some real interesting ideas based on the deep science uh, that can impact that. So this is a major moonshot and a major visionary, um, a, uh, a amazingly hardcore entrepreneur we could even get into in more stories and an inspiration. I'm pleased to uh, invite Pry up to the stage. Uh, so thank you, Barney, for the warm introduction. And thank you, Ajay, and everybody at CDL for inviting me here to speak with you. So um, as Barney mentioned, I've been a scientist and an entrepreneur in the women's health space for over 20 years now. Um, and as someone who's been in the field for some time, I can tell you that um, we are today in the middle of a sea change. And um, I also want to help empower you guys as AI innovators and investors. Um, to do more to improve the lives of women around the world. So many of you have seen the recent news that Apple's next OS update will in include menstrual cycle tracking. And some of you may be wondering, well, why is this newsworthy? Well, back in 2014, when Apple launched a suite of health apps um, that supposedly would allow people to track just about everything from asthma symptoms to sodium intake, Unfortunately, one huge oversight was that they did not include functionality for one of the most common health metrics that women track, which is their periods. And this wasn't a small oversight. 
there are nearly two billion humans on Earth who have periods. <laughs> and over 100 million of them currently use one of the approximately 1,000 period tracking apps on the market to track their cycles. Tracking periods lets women better plan their lives around their cycles, whether they're trying to conceive or avoiding conceiving. It also allows them to better understand things that fluctuate throughout a menstrual cycle, like mood and weight. And over $350 million of investment has been made into these period tracking apps over the last few years. And the founders of the popular Clue period tracking app coined the term Fempec to describe this new breed of technology-enabled companies serving the needs of women. The category has broadened since then to include a whole host of technologies and applications related to women's health. Over $650 million of investment was made into this Femtech category last year, and the sector is trending to have its first billion dollar year this year in 2019. And I think in many ways, it's been tremendously helpful to define a new category in this way around these companies. And Femtech is certainly punchy, but it can also be limiting because many of these companies are not necessarily tech companies, but rather they're a next generation of women's health companies that are leveraging technology, data, and machine intelligence to create greater equality for women. I also think the emphasis on FEM minimizes the fact that bringing better health outcomes to women actually impacts all of humankind. And as I like to joke, everyone in this room was a woman for at least six to nine months of their life. <laughs> so given so much of all of our lifelong health is set into motion with the quality of a single egg, and certainly in utero. Women's health and human health are inextricably linked. This new breed of companies, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about a few of them, is doing many things from designing more personalized consumer products to better therapeutics. So for example, I was just in Toronto a few weeks ago and had the privilege of speaking on a panel with the founder of Dame Products, which is as they call it, closing the pleasure gap for women. On the surface, they're a company that sells sex toys. But what sets them apart is that they're also collecting data about anatomical differences from woman to woman that impacts her sexual wellness. The founder also shared with me that unexpected things are coming out of this data. Users are sharing powerful anecdotes about having more orgasms has led to improved outcomes for chronic conditions and even the menopause transition. And we reflected together about how there's so little data on something so fundamental. Another amazing company called LV has built off of the success of its tech-enabled wearable for improving postpartum pelvic floor function and urinary incontinence to launch the first silent wearable breast pump. This is an absolute game changer for countless women who have had to explain with discomfort why there's a loud rhythmic droning in the background of a conference call. True story. <laughs> or who have lost precious breast milk while navigating an unwieldy and antiquated breast pump. Also true story. But more importantly, just like Dame Products is closing the pleasure gap, Better tools for postpartum recovery and breastfeeding close the opportunity gap for women in the workplace and set them and their children up for lifelong health. And finally, my company, Cellmatics, as Barney mentioned, has invested a decade into building a powerful multi-omics data platform with applications in women's reproductive health and longevity. We call it the Reproductive Atlas. Reproductive Atlas powers a number of in-market applications, which he also kindly mentioned, but I'm particularly excited that we've recently announced our new biosciences division. With these data, we are now helping to move the field away from hormone-based drugs and into a next generation of targeted therapeutics for women's health indications. Our lead program is in ovarian aging. We have designed and soon will be taking into preclinical development drugs that we believe will enable women to control their age of menopause, including potentially delaying it for decades. And we're also working on conditions like endometriosis, which in the US alone results in an annual $100 billion of burden to the healthcare system and the economy, but has no drugs to target it. 
We also recently received generous support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for an exploratory initiative to see if we can use the reproductive atlas to uncover non-hormonal drug targets for new contraceptive drugs. Like most women's health companies, we struggle to have this work funded, often because we hear that the market is niche. Hopefully this slide will convince you that developing better reproductive health solutions is critical to the survival of our species. I mentioned that women's health is human health. However, I want to sidebar for a second specifically to women's reproductive health. So an unprecedented experiment is being conducted around the world as we speak which is that women are waiting well into their 30s and 40s to start or expand their family. As you can see on this logarithmic scale chart here, birth rates have consistently been declining for younger mothers and raising for mothers older than 35. In a study that we at Cellmatics did with over 3,000 millennial-aged women in the U.S., we found that over 50% of them are planning to wait until after 30 to start their families, and one in four of them are planning to wait until after 35. That's completely unprecedented. When I share those statistics with fertility specialists, they exhale in shock at the implications for our species. In some countries, we already see infertility rates as high as 25%, so that's true for China. And based on the current trajectory, if we don't develop better reproductive health solutions, infertility will be the norm and not the exception for future generations. So with 2019 projected to be Femtech's first billion dollar year, we're making strides. But we have to do better, faster, to meet the needs of both current and future generations. And we have to start with better data. Current data gaps institutionalize bias against women at every level of innovation and product development. For example, until recently, not only were most drugs not tested in women before they were put on the market, but they weren't even tested in female laboratory animals. So it's not surprising that women are much more likely than men to have adverse reactions or not respond to drugs. Another important and kind of interesting institutional uh, example of institutional bias in healthcare is a men's health drug that we all know well, which is Viagra. It was originally tested as a heart medication, but the drug had a noticeable side effect on men. Another side effect was also observed in subsequent studies, which was total relief of menstrual pain in women for up to four hours. This follow-up study was conducted by an independent researcher and unfortunately was stopped due to lack of funding. The investigator believes, based on his experience, that this was simply because menstrual pain was not deemed a sufficient public health concern. But in reality, we know that menstrual pain costs society billions of dollars in lost productivity for women in the workforce. The next example is probably well known to this audience, which is that studies have found that Google's and other voice recognition software are more accurate when men are speaking. This wouldn't be such a big deal if this only resulted in women having to repeat themselves when asking Alexa to please turn down the music. But we know that voice recognition is increasingly powering the world. The other area that bias and data gaps are a problem is in product design. One simple example is the piano. Pianos were designed for men's hands and may explain why, why women, who on average have much smaller hands than men, struggle to break into the highest levels of achievement with this instrument. But a much more serious example of flawed product design is that from 1978 until 2012, crash test dummies were modeled after what was then considered the average human. It turns out that what they were actually modeling on was the 50th percentile male. Not surprisingly, women are now 50% more likely to be seriously injured in car crashes and nearly 20% more likely to die. When female crash test dummies were finally instituted, the safety rating of many vehicles plummeted. When I speak on this topic, I'm often asked why I think this underlying bias exists. And I think the answer is clear, which is that there are huge funding disparities at every level, public, private, and philanthropic. This isn't something that will be fixed with a proliferation of seed funds. We need an initiative on the scale of the cancer moonshot in the US, but dedicated to women's health. On the private sector side, we need funds with billions of dollars dedicated to women's health to start to scratch the surface. 
To get a sense of the funding gaps, this chart shows that while overall VC funding has continued to rise over the last decade, the funding rates for female-founded companies has stayed steady at approximately 2%. 2%. We also need more females empowered as check writers. Currently, female VCs only represent about 10% of the investment community. It's been demonstrated that women show more investment interest in companies led by women. And it's not just favoritism. Innovation requires an understanding of why the status quo is inadequate. And when you can personally relate to a problem, you're more likely to be well positioned to solve it or fund the solution. Another thought I wanted to share is that while we work together to solve these funding disparities, we also need to raise the bar of expectation for these companies. Because we aren't tackling these disparities in a systematic way, many of the companies being funded simply don't have the data or the science to create evidence-based products. Many are skirting regulations by claiming to be, quote, wellness products. They're not adhering to strict privacy standards like HIPAA to protect consumer data. They're not publishing their findings in peer-reviewed journals or at medical conferences. And generally, they're not engaging with experts. For example, I told you that 100 million women around the world are sharing their data with and making decisions using these per period tracking apps. These decisions include when to time sex for conception or when to avoid sex to prevent unwanted pregnancies. And with Apple soon making that even easier through seamless integration with the iPhone and the Apple Watch, that number will grow exponentially. But studies are emerging, including this one, that most free smartphone menstrual cycle tracking apps for patient use are inaccurate and few cite medical literature or have health professional involvement. We have to raise the bar. So hopefully, I have succeeded in convincing you that women's health needs your help as funders, as innovators. So how do we bridge the gap? Well, first, we have to destigmatize women's bodies. I'm pretty sure this is the first CDL talk that mentioned periods, vibrators, urinary incontinence, breast milk, and menopause, all in the span of about 15 minutes. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll be invited back. <laughs> but in seriousness, it's actually uncomfortable for me <laughs> to stand on stage and talk about these things. It's probably uncomfortable for some of you guys to hear me talk about these things. I was raised, we were raised in a culture that told us it's not polite to talk about issues like this in private, much less in public. But that stigma is a big part of the problem, and we have to dismantle it if we really want change. So let me end on a positive note, which is the example of how we have begun to bridge the connectivity gap in Africa. At the dawn of affordable mobile technology, much of Africa was without landline telephones. By 2014, even though only still about 2% of families had access to landline telephones in their home in Africa. The mobile phone usage rates were similar to those in the United States. So this was not a case of incremental change leading to new access. This was a case of revolutionary technological advancement, eradicating the need for that incremental change. And I think with artificial intelligence, we now have this opportunity to revolutionize women's health in the same way. So I'll end with my call to action which is for everyone who's developing these amazing AI-driven technologies to remember to include women in your data sets and in your products from day one. And for those of you with amazing AI hammers that are looking for a nail, I would challenge you to apply your technology to bring greater equality to women. And in doing so, help us relegate the disparities I shared with you today to the history books. Thank you. <laughs>